On today's travel bites with Liesel AC1, eight countries in 11 months, a broad framework. This is going to be a two-part series where I talk to you on 10 different topics that might be helpful for you if you decide to do a similar trip like I did through Africa. The first part is going to deal with topics such as clustering, visa, money, luggage, and transport. The second part is going to deal with topics such as accommodation, communication and shopping, healthcare, language and activities. So with no further ado, let's jump into the first part of this journey. 21st October 2020, I flew to Tanzania and 26th of August 2021, I came back to Munich. If you looked at the trailer, if you looked at the introduction, you noticed that there's some kind of regional thing going on and that brings me to point number one, clustering. I love road travel, so be it trains, buses, cabs, bikes, whatever. I like to travel via road travel because I feel it's authentic and you share more of experience with the locals. So I pick countries that share land borders, making it easier for me to travel via road. So I went from Tanzania to Kenya, from Kenya to Uganda, from Uganda to Rwanda, from Rwanda to Burundi, from Burundi to Zambia, from Zambia to Botswana, from Botswana to Namibia. Now, I was not successful in going to all of them via land because we all know the times that we're in, so some land borders were closed, so I had to fly. In this clustering, countries such as Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe would have also fit nicely. Again, for example, Malawi, they stopped issuing tourist visas in June, but it wasn't very obvious on their website, so I applied for a visa, which is still pending. So these are some of the things you want to keep in mind if you're planning to do such a trip. Always look at the most actual information. That's why I'm not going to be giving you any guidelines regarding any of those because they change so much. So bear in mind, clustering 
and to maximize you know your time and the experience but if you don't want to go by road you can always fly. Point two visas. I'm a dual passport holder. I've got two passports. I've got a Nigerian passport and a German passport. For the West African part of my journey, I went with my Nigerian passport. For this part of it, I went with my German passport. And I still do have to apply for visas on the German passport. For two countries, I could enter visa-free for 90 days, and that was Namibia and Botswana. For the rest of them, I preferred to do the online visa. So I had my visa approval letter with me when I got to the border or the port of entry. The only place where an online visa was not possible was in Burundi. In Burundi, you had to physically go to the embassy. So I went to the embassy in Lusaka. It cost $90 for a month's visa in Burundi. It was also the visa that took the longest to process, about eight days. If we look at all the other countries, I had either single entry visas that were $50 and had a validity of 90 days, or I had the so-called group original visa. So for example, in the case of um, the East African tourist visa, which you can use for Uganda, Kenya and Rwanda, it's valid for 90 days, costs $50, but then you have to split the 90 days between these three countries, which could be enough for you, depending on what you have in mind. The other group visa sort of thing I had was the Casa visa. The Casa visa, um, is for Zambia and Zimbabwe. I initially planned to go to Zimbabwe, but Zimbabwe had closed their land borders, making it impossible for me to cross from Livingstone to Victoria Falls, so I decided to skip it. The visa is valid for 30 days, and you can go back and forth between the two countries. So most of them actually just took three to five days to process. And like I said, you get the visa approval letter printed, take it with you. At the airport, you get a stamp. You have to be vigilant about what is stamped onto your passport because sometimes they just stamp you in 30 days instead of 90 if you really want to stay 90 days. Be alert about that because that could be problematic for you. So for example, you see this one, it says 90 days on the top. So that's it for visas. We're moving on to the third point, which is money. In terms of money, I don't like traveling with cash and it worked everywhere. I didn't have to take any physical cash with me apart from in Burundi again. Burundi In Burundi, cash is king. With that, I mean dollars. It's better for you to come into the country with dollars. Otherwise, everywhere else, I used my Visa card, which I got from uh, the German bank, Deutsche Credit Bank. I made that account solely for traveling. It is good because they have partnerships with a lot of banks across the world, and you can withdraw with little or no fees attached to it. And I was literally withdrawing money everywhere I went and paying with cash. So here are my Namibian dollars. I was not very good because <laughs> I have a lot of leftover from Namibia. Uh, those are Burindian francs in case you've never seen them. And that is a Botswana pula. And of course, in most of these countries, you still use coins. So I've got a bag of coins here as well. For the other countries, I was quite good. I have no currency left. A few coins maybe in the bag. So Ugandan shillings, Kenyan shillings, kwacha, one or two of those are in the bag. Another thing I do want to say about money is which ATMs were uh, okay for me. So in Tanzania, I used Tambic and Umoja. Maximum withdrawal was about 400,000 Tanzanian shillings and there was a charge for withdrawing. In Kenya, I think I used the Bank of Kenya. Uganda, I used Stambik. In Rwanda, Bank of Kigali. In Burundi, none. In Zambia, Namibia and Botswana, I used FSB or sometimes also Stambik. In Zambia, there was a limit of 4,000 sometimes per withdrawal and sometimes 6,000. In Livingstone, it was 6,000, so that was okay. So yes, that was it for money. And um, when it had to book online, I actually used a different credit card to book, maybe things like flights and hotel, but I then booked online. So we're moving on to luggage. Some of you have already asked, how did I manage to travel through Africa with a suitcase? It is very possible. So let me talk about my luggage items. I had my Samsonite suitcase, which weighed 28 kilos. I'm gonna to come to why it weighed that much. 
It weighed 28 kilos and I had my backpack as a hand luggage, a Deuter backpack that had all my electronics in it. And I don't know what it weighed. I avoided it being weighed, but it was heavy. It had every electronics I had in it. So, and then I also had in my Samsonite suitcase a day pack and my small handbag where my documents were in. So that was what I had in terms of baggage stuff, plus my tripod, which was um, extra. I had it on carry-on bag. Now, what was in my suitcase and why was it so heavy? I have shoe size 42 right, in normal shoes and shoe size 45 in running or trekking shoes. So I take all my shoes with me. I wasn't gonna take any chances. So I had seven pairs of shoes in it and one of them actually got damaged and I had to leave it. So I came back with six. And those were more like two hiking shoes, one running shoes, a pair of loafers, a pair of sandals, a pair of hiking sandals and flip flops. That was it. I had no high heels, there was no time for that. And what else could have made my bag heavy? My yoga mat. But it was very instrumental. When you take buses for several kilometers, you need to stretch. And I didn't have to worry where I was lying on. I had my yoga mat with me. So I used it more towards the end. Um, were there clothing items in my bag that I could have done without? Of course. But um, overall, I may be aiming to try and get it lighter next time. <laughs> And yes, I did fly in country and between countries in Africa and the luggage allowance is usually 23 kilos. So how did I get by? My tripod was always in a shopping bag I got from Carrefour that has like a lion print on it. It was a really nice shopping bag. So every time I had to fly, I would take out the excess five kilos and put it in that one and then I'll be able to fly. So it wasn't a problem at all. But however, having said that, you would be challenged because you can't just take any bus, except you don't care about your suitcase. You just have to look for the ones that have a luggage room. So the luxurious buses, the bigger ones, they have a, a luggage area or luggage compartment, so they're used to that. Or I have to look for a car that has a trunk. I couldn't just go with any car. I felt like I had to be uh, vigilant about what um, transport option I picked. Another thing that was that is a possibility if you do travel with a suitcase and you're going to be uh, around for a long time is maybe finding a hotel in the first city you get to where you might come back to where you can leave your suitcase. I did that in several countries and it was fine. I did it in Zambia, I did it in uh, Namibia, I did it in Rwanda, I did it in Uganda, I did it in Burundi, I left the suitcase in the main hotel where I was at the beginning or something and then I traveled with my hand luggage, the backpack and the day pack. So then I was a bit more mobile. But having said that, some of these buses have really, really not very good luggage compartments in the bus, overhead compartments, so you still can't even put your backpack there. You have to put it on your thighs or under the seat or something. I had this issue a lot in Zambia because the luggage compartment was bad. Um, what's bad? It was, I mean, it just looked like it was meant for a handbag or, or a laptop bag. Nothing that had, you know, a bit of a width was not meant to be put in there. So that's it about luggage. And did anything happen to my luggage? Because nope, nothing happened. I can still use them. So we're moving on to the topic transport. For transport, I am dividing it into three categories. We're going to be talking about transport in Eastern Africa, transport in Southern Africa, and then trains and flights. So for Eastern Africa, the common modes of transportation you will find within cities are, you know, the big buses, the small buses, taxis, you will find Bajaji, which is a tricycle, and you will find um, Boda Boda, which is a motorbike. In Nigeria, we call that Okada. And the fifth one is really funny. Those are bicycles. I had never seen them before. They're bicycles with like a passenger seat. And I saw this in Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi. And get this, the ones in Rwanda are registered. They have a license plate, and they have a jersey with their number on it. Like how organized do you have to be for you to have that kind of stuff? I was like, wow, a lot of respect. Um, yeah, so they're registered. When it comes to using taxi apps in uh, Dar es Salaam, Bolt and Uber works, in Wanza, Bolt works, and for both of them, you can call Bajaji's taxis and Boda Boda. And then in 
Kenya, I used Uber in Nairobi. In Uganda, in Kampala, I used Uber. In Rwanda, you had Yego Camps. And in Burundi, you had Wasili. So you could use any of this to get around. When we come over to Intercity, there are different uh, buses that are available. So in Tanzania, you had different sizes. You had the luxurious buses, you had the coasters, you had the small ones. The bus pack experience in Tanzania is not so nice. They hassle you for everything and anything. The bus pack experience in Rwanda is amazing, peaceful. You buy your ticket, you get in. Everything is organized and clean. In Kenya, I think I only used two big buses. Once leaving Kenya to Uganda, so I used Mashkul from Nakuru and maybe going to Nakuru. Otherwise, it was more like coasters. So, I, yeah, that's more what I used in, in Kenya. And then I used to train in Kenya as well. In Uganda, I can't unfortunately comment about the intercity buses because I hired a car and a driver. I had a car from Road Trip Africa, a RAV4, that was really good. Or was it a RAV3? I don't know. <laughs> a RAV, definitely. It was really good because we were able to get around with it and my guide was great. So if you do need a guide, reach out to me. I can give you his contact details. So we drove around with the car for six days and I was able to go to the parks I wanted to go to. So I don't know about the intercity buses in Uganda. In Rwanda, they're quite good. Like I mentioned, I use Ritiko, Kivu Express, quite a number of them. And they were on time. They were, I had a delay once, but it wasn't that bad. And then in Burundi, I think the bigger buses just ply like major cities and everywhere between you had like cabs or small buses. So that was more or less my experience with moving around in Burundi. And again, when you got to the villages in Burundi, I just picked a Boda Boda guy who was then my permanent uh, <laughs> commute person uh, throughout the days I was there. So I used uh, the Boda Boda to go to the tour sites in Burundi. So that's it for Eastern Africa. Let's head over to Southern Africa. In Southern Africa, in Zambia, <sighs> The experience was the worst if I had to rate it now just solely because the road network is not very connected so every time you wanted to go somewhere you almost had to go back to a major city to get the bus to where you were going to and sometimes they didn't leave daily or it was just crazy it wasn't the best experience at all in terms of just being flexible and moving from A to B without having to repeat several kilometers that weren't necessary I think I must have done, uh, when I left Zambia initially, I was clocking about 6,000 kilometers. I came in again the last few days to head over to Tanzania. I must be about 7,000 kilometers through Zambia by now, and it was not the best experience. But however, I did find a company that I liked and I was able to use them. Uh, Power Tools, I can recommend them. They have a good connectivity when it, when it comes to going around in Zambia. Now, if we look at Lusaka, the town, they have a taxi app, Ulendo. Ulendo is good. It's pricey. Uh, otherwise, just using the public transport could be frustrating. Very frustrating. So if you drive, maybe get in a car and driving around Zambia may be better for you. So that's Zambia. Botswana was quite easy going, network good, road good. I mean, if you are not going to the tourist sites there, it's like you're going to the desert. So you need your own car, you need a 4x4, you need this and that. Um, but if you're like going between towns, they had a good uh, bus network, they had good taxi network. So when I got into Kasane, to go from one place to another was like six pull or four drop in the taxi with four people. If you were going to... Um, if you were going to... Take the taxi for yourself, it was anywhere between 24 to 28 Pula. Between Kasana and Maun, I flew because it was very cheap. And then um, from Maun to Nata, I just took some Sprinter and it was like, I waited at the bus stop and oh my God, there they didn't have a luggage compartment. So the guy lifted my suitcase and it was like, oh, what is inside this suitcase? I was like, I'm really sorry, I know it's heavy. So he had to keep it inside in front. And from Nata, I took a small bus to Francis Town. They didn't have space for my luggage either. I had to take an extra seat. And then from Francis Town, I got a big bus to Habarone. But from Habarone, I flew back to Caserna because <sighs> I was done clocking the kilometers and it was affordable. 
So moving over to Namibia. Namibia, um, I entered through the Ngoma border and the biggest city that was closest to me was Katima Mulilo. In Katima Mulilo, a taxi drop was anywhere between 10 to $12, Namibian dollars. And it was easy to get one. You just walk out to the main road. The only irritating thing in Katima Mulilo is the taxis don't have a sign saying they're taxis. So you might just be flagging someone's private car down, which happened a couple of times, uh, because they don't have a taxi sign. So you, you're guessing. But what they do do is they hoop, so you know, okay, they're taxis. But there is no sign saying that they're taxis. From Katima Mulilo to Windhoek, I took a bus, a big bus, Silas something. Um, they had a luggage room, so it wasn't a problem with my suitcase. I took them twice, back and forth, because I left through the Nguma border again. From Windhoek to Schwakoff Moon and from Valvis Bay back to Windhoek, I used uh, Kalo Shuttle, which was a smaller sprinter kind of bus, and it was a bit more expensive, but it was good value because they picked you up direct from the hotel, and it wasn't full, so it was quite nice. Otherwise, in Namibia, all of the nice places that you want to go to, I'm really sorry, but you need a private vehicle, a 4x4. You either need to be driving yourself or you get a, a guide uh, with a car and then you're fine. So that's what I did. I went with Randy and he was quite experienced, so it was cool. We could touch all of the places that I needed to go. Flights and trains. For flying, I flew seven times. I flew four times in country. Twice in Botswana using Air Botswana, twice in Tanzania using Precision and Air Tanzania. Most times I flew it was because the distance by road would have just been crazy and the flight tickets were affordable. So for example, the distance between Kigoma to Dar es Salaam would have just been crazy or from Mwanza to Arusha and um, it was okay to fly. The only thing about the flights there locally, the planes are a smaller type, and so the cabin, um, the space for the cabin luggage also could not contain my Doita backpack, so I had to kind of like put it under the seat, and that was otherwise okay. Between countries, I flew from Uganda to Rwanda, from Rwanda to Burundi, from Burundi to Zambia and for those three flights I used two airlines, one Kenyan Airways and the second one Rwandan Air. Both experiences were good, I can't complain. If we talk about trains, I took the train three times, two times between Mombasa and Nairobi, so back and forth, and in Tanzania. The train in Kenya is fancy dancy, station is new, everything is cool, this, I mean I can't complain, it's perfect. The train experience in Tanzania is more nostalgic, epic, and you know, you got this train moving slowly and bouncing you back and forth with interesting landscape outside. I really liked it. I took an overnight train from Dar es Salaam to Arusha and I took a sleeper second class and I had, it had space for six people. There was a lady with two kids in there. It was fun. You know, we just chilled and hung out together. It was cool. I, I can definitely recommend it if you're looking for a cultural experience that takes you somewhere. So that's it on transportation. So guys, finishing on a strong note, I am now at the Ngoma border. I'm going to cross into Kaserne and then head to the Kazungula border where I'm hoping to cross into Zambia. And then from Zambia, I need to find my way to Tanzania. It's been beautiful. I had a little hip hiccup with the COVID test, getting it on time, but everything has worked out till now. So wish me luck. Keep your fingers crossed that everything continues to go fine. I do hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'm looking forward to seeing you back for part two. Thank you very much for watching. Yours truly, Liesl81.